the title of the talk is Type 2 Diabetes, Why We Are Winning the Battle But Losing the War. So let me start with the good news. The good news is nationally, we are beginning to see significant and impressive declines in rates of complications among people with diabetes, uh, notably uh, rates of heart attacks, strokes, end-stage renal disease, amputations, and hyperglycemic deaths. And I think this is happening due to several reasons, but I want to emphasize three of them. Firstly, it's a result of good investment in science, basic clinical and epidemiological science. Secondly, it's also related directly to the emphasis from the CDC, the ADA, and the NIDDK on translation research. That is, how do you take evidence and get it implemented in practice? And thirdly, the emphasis on quality improvement nationally and the need to measure changes in quality of care for people with diabetes, largely led by CDC, uh, ADA, NIDDK, et cetera. So all of this is good news, that the, that the people with diabetes are beginning to experience less rate of complications. But the not so good news is that although the rates of complications are going down, the numbers of people with these complications in absolute numbers are actually going up. That's because the prevalence of the disease has been going up and the incidence of the disease has been going up there are more people who are surviving diabetes and therefore you'll have greater numbers of people with these complications in the system. And the implication of that on the healthcare cost is enormous. For example, if you look at Medicare, uh, the leading cause for rising healthcare costs in that population is diabetes. So the question really is how do we now win the war also? And for that, I think we need to emphasize prevention. We need to prevent diabetes in the first place and there are two things we can do for that. The first is what we can do in the short term. Clearly there is evidence among people with prediabetes that effective lifestyle interventions can prevent progression to diabetes. But we, in the first place, we need to identify those people with prediabetes. So we need a screening policy to identify people with prediabetes. And then we need infrastructure to deliver lifestyle interventions to these populations and mechanisms to have lifestyle interventions reimbursed, etc. So that can be done, and some of it is happening, but we need to do a lot more of that. Secondly, when it comes to prevention overall, this is where we need massive global collaborations. Because when you look at the world today, there's an explosion of diabetes worldwide, even in rural parts of low- and middle-income countries. And a lot of these people are developing diabetes, although their BMIs are still small. So there might be factors other than insulin resistance and obesity that might be contributing to diabetes. This could be poor insulin secretion. That raises the question of whether we need to start thinking of type 2 diabetes, not as one entity, but as several entities, at least maybe a form, I would call it type 2A, which is related to insulin resistance and obesity, and maybe a type 2B, which is related to insulin secretion. And that second type is understudied, under-investigated, and its size is likely to be very large, not only globally, but also in the U.S. immigrant population, particularly those from Asia and Africa. In the U.S., uh, we have shown reductions in complication rates, but that's not a uh, reason for complacence. We now need to turn on the same kind of determination to prevent diabetes. And to do that, we have to implement known lifestyle interventions in people with prediabetes and simultaneously expand global collaborations to study and understudied populations that may have different phenotypes of diabetes and from where we can learn of how to prevent diabetes globally and also in the U.S. immigrant populations.